gather at the river where bright angels be one with it. Yes, we'll gather at the river. came into my heart. 194. What a wonderful change my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have died my soul for you a break. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you tonight, uh, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for the goodness and mercy that you show to us each and every day. Lord, as we bow our heads and as we worship you this evening, Lord, I just pray that, uh, Lord, our hearts would be knit uh, and tuned together uh, with the Holy Spirit as he uh, directs us tonight to the service. Heavenly Father, we, uh, Lord, look to you for the peace, the comfort, the strength that comes only from thee. Heavenly Father, I pray uh, Lord, this evening, that, uh, Lord, as we open the Word of God, as we study uh, from the book of Ezekiel, that we'll see a truth, uh, Lord, that would resonate within our own hearts, our own lives, to help us, Lord, to realize uh, where we're at uh, in, on the on your timetable uh, in the way of, uh, of the last days. Father, we just pray uh, this evening, Lord, that uh, you'd be with those that are unable to be here, uh, or there's some that are ill, some that are traveling, uh, Lord, we pray for mercy and grace for them that are traveling and they're ill. 
Father, we just pray that you speak to our hearts once again. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, we uh, thank you for visiting with us. We appreciate you being here. Uh, just a couple of things I want to call your attention to. It's in the bulletin. Uh, in the bulletin, I, I make it as colorful and as informative. Uh, I even put pictures in there. You know, so even Brother Roy could even read it. Uh, you know, kind of figure out why what's going on. Uh, but uh, if you read it, then I don't have to uh, read it to you. Our brother Gary doesn't have to read it to you on Sunday morning. Uh, but a couple of things. Number one, Mother's Day is coming up, and it's coming up very quickly. It, you know, I just looked at the calendar this morning. Whoa, <laughs> Mother's Day is upon us. So uh, it's the first the Sunday in, sep- in, in September. Well, it's not quite that close. <laughs> I didn't get my nap this afternoon. It's your fault. Uh, but uh, uh, the first Sunday of May, and uh, looking forward to that, uh, uh, you begin to invite and uh, uh, folks to come and, uh, and be here for you. There, you know, I, I've got a number of adopted children that my wife and I have adopted. I think there's 12, 13, something like that, plus grandkids. Uh, for, unfortunately, all of them go to church. <laughs> I should say, fortunately, all of them go to church. <laughs> Just not here, all of them. And uh, so... Uh, uh, anyway, but I'm I've been inviting people to come to be here at the Mother's Day service. You ought to also, uh, and if you invite them, uh, they may come. And if you if you know, but don't get discouraged if they don't come. All right, because some people will tell you absolutely I will be there, and then when you see them in Walmart the next time, they'll duck behind the uh, the uh, racks and and hide from you and all of that, or they'll have this wonderful excuse about this emergency came up and we had to, you know, uh, so, you know, there's a little song that says, excuses, excuses, you hear them every day, the devil, he'll provide them, from church you'll stay away, right? So, uh, (laughs) well, the preacher talks too loud or he talks too soft or, you know, he didn't shake my hand, uh, whatever it is, but, uh, you know, there's always an excuse not to be here. Uh, but do invite folks to come. If you invite them uh, and pray diligently that God would uh, work in their heart to be here, uh, we'll have more folks here than, than if we don't. And Mother's Day seems to be kind of one of those natural highs when, you know, the kids want to go to church with Mama or Grandma, and uh, we have a few of each of those here, so uh, just be in your place. Uh, uh, also, uh, on the 30th, we're having a senior carnival Information is back on the back table. Miss Amanda will be back there to help uh, you uh, decipher all that's out there, but uh, uh, is to help Jason uh, and his mother as far as helping with this graduation and the, all the plans and things that we do uh, for graduation. And Jason uh, will be graduating on the 14th from San Jacinto College North with his associate's degree, and then he will graduate on the 19th from our school uh, with his high school diploma. So he's getting a two-year associate's degree from college first, and then his high school diploma. Uh, but uh, we've had, I think he's the third student that uh, graduated from the program with honors. And uh, so uh, he's had to maintain his high school curriculum as well as his college curriculum. And uh, I, I know I couldn't do it, uh, but he's a very intelligent young man. So uh, just help us out with that. Again, we'll need some help with, uh, with booths and things like that as well. Uh, financial help in some of the areas, and uh, Miss Amanda has it all lined out out there. You can sign up for whatever you want to. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not signing up for the dunking booth, but uh, uh, if you do, I will help. <laughs> That's all I will say. I won't be in it, but I will definitely uh, help you while you're in it. Uh, I don't know that we're having a dunking booth, but you know, just there. Uh, you know, Father's Day's coming up. Just. Just continue to be faithful to what I'm trying to say. Everything that we do is geared for one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to win the loss for Christ. And uh, so it's uh, it's good. We had a young, a young uh, man here this morning that Brother Mark had invited. He said, I told you I'd come, and he said, and I came. And uh, he told me on the way out, he said, I don't know if I'll be here tonight. He said, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to be back on Wednesday night. And he said, I will definitely be here next Sunday. So, uh, you know, just be faithful. If you're faithful, uh, God is faithful. And, uh, of course, God's always faithful, whether you are not. But uh, be faithful to his service, and I'll guarantee he'll bless. All right? Again, thank you for being here. Turn to page number 413. 
page number 413. Let's all stand while we'll the men come forward and see the offering on the last verse. 413. Jason's not here to, to hear this. I really wish he was, but I can't help thinking we're having a carnival for our seniors. He's the only senior. Does that mean he's going to clown college? That, that's... <laughs> no, no, there are a lot meaner things that I'm choosing not to say, so... Uh, uh, First John 5:14, and this is the confidence we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will he heareth us and if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him we talked about this last week I just want to reiterate that if we ask anything according to his will he hears us you part of that is according to his will. A lot of times we we ask all kinds of stuff. We want all kinds of weird things. Uh, as I was driving up here this afternoon. I passed by a, a, a car. A, um, a, I can't remember what kind of car it was. I knew it right before we walked out here. It was uh, uh, some big sedan, slow family car type had a big wing on the back. Something similar to that, right? So, something big like a Cadillac or a, I think it was a Seville. Anyway, some big car, right? With, with a big spoiler running across the back, big wing. That guy did not need a wing on the back of that. There is no way that car is going to get fast enough to need a wing to hold down those rear tires. I'm sorry, it's not happening. There was no bulge in the hood where there's a blower on it. No, it's not happening. You know, we want things, all sorts of stuff. That guy really wanted a wing on his really slow, big car. He thinks he's cool. Okay, whatever. Just makes me laugh. But, you know, we want a lot of things that kind of make God laugh. Right? Well, what? Why? The trick, of course, is to know his will and to pray in his will. And that's where my one of my favorite verses in the Bible comes into play. First John, first John. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. The only thing that God ever asks, every, 
God ever promises that every person who ever asks, he's not only going to give you what you ask for, but he's give you more than what you ever asked for, and he's never going to say no. Amazing thing. That's not. We receive the offering. Ask yourself this question. When you're praying, are you praying in the will of God? Or are you praying in the will of you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for allowing us to come here tonight. I want to thank you for the message that the uh, pastor has for us. Uh, thank you in advance for the offering we're about to take up. Please bless them all. Please bless our offering. May it go a long way to your service. Please fill the pastor with the Holy Ghost with wisdom. Give him the word to say. Give him the message that we need to receive tonight. All these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Bibles and turn to Ezekiel chapter number 11, Ezekiel chapter number 11, where the Kurt was quoting James 1, 5, I was thinking, you know, in our politically, politically correct, gender neutral society, that verse would have said, if any person lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, and he will and he give liberty to all persons, <laughs> going, you know, we can make a big deal over a pronoun or a noun that is inclusive of everybody and that, well, you know. <laughs> but honestly and truthfully, when we look at the Bible, the Word of God, it's very clear and very plain that the Word of God is for all people. It doesn't matter what uh, ethnicity, it doesn't matter what gender, it doesn't matter uh, anything, the Bible for everybody, and uh, it, it's for all ages, and it's kind of what I want us to see tonight, I'm going to speak tonight on the subject, the irony of a liberal's message, the irony of a liberal's message, okay, an irony is when the outcome is different than expected, when working with my literature classes over the last uh few months, I don't know if they've ever gotten it yet, uh, about irony in, in, in prose and irony in writing, and uh, you know, it comes up just about in every story we read, and it says, you know, what's the irony of da-da-da, you know, and, the, and if some, if it, if it, somebody will raise their hand and say, Mr. Lamb, what's an irony? <laughs> the fact that you're asking me that question. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, and, and I put it that way because the, it, it's, in, it's interesting. It can be one word or a phrase of words uh, that suggests one thing and then becomes something else. Even though this may not be a categorized as, in the ironic sense, I see a pattern here that is worth noting. And I want you to, before I read the text, I, I want to call your attention to four names. In the Bible, names are very important. And because the, the name usually has some uh, significance to the message that God has given us. And so, uh, like Joshua uh, is the same as what we would translate into uh, in the Bible to, as Jesus. Okay, And so, uh, Moses was drawn out. That means, you know, and he was literally drawn out of the water. So we see uh, pictures this way. We see different uh, messages uh, in the word, and I want to uh, lay this foundation. There are two priests that are named uh, in our text as well as their fathers. 
And if you take notes, you might want to use the back of your, your uh, bulletin from this morning if you don't already have it all written up uh, to, to write this down. If you write in your Bible, my Bible looks like a road map. Sometimes I stumble over a, uh, a, a word or two, and it's because uh, sometimes because my contacts slip and I, you know, like a big blur, uh, kind of like my brain, or uh, there's writing there and it's kind of run together. Uh, but, you know, you can write these in the margins of your Bible. Uh, but there's there's four names I want to call your attention to. Uh, the first name is Jaazaniah. Jaazaniah. Now, Jaazaniah, and it's in verse number, uh, let's see, verse number one, uh, towards the end of verse number one in chapter 11, Jaazaniah, uh, is the son of Azur, A-Z-U-R. And then there's Pelatiah. Uh, he's the son of Benaiah, okay? And um, the name Jeazaniah means God hears. God hears. The name Azur, his father, means God helps. God helps. I'm not going too fast. Okay, those of you taking notes, I want you to get it right, okay? I'll grade your notes after a while and turn it back to you. See how you did. All right. Pelatiah, his name is translated, the translation of the name, God delivers. God delivers. And his father's name was Benaiah, and his name equates to God builds. God builds. Now, notice, if we follow this pattern, God hears, God helps, God delivers, God builds. You see a pattern here? Okay, the way the names are listed in the text, if we just use the, the, the equivalent of the name, God hears, God helps, God delivers, and God builds. I, I think that is just an amazing picture right there. Because when we look at it from our standpoint as a child of God, we look at it that God hears and answers our prayers. God helps us in our times of need. God delivers us. And God builds us. And so, as we're looking at it this way, as we're looking at it in the prophetic sense here that God has given it to us, uh, let's read verses 1, 2, and 3. We're going to use the entire chapter uh, if I get to it. But... Uh, uh, I want to look at it this way because there's another statement here in verse number one that I want you to really focus in on that I'm going to talk about also before we get into the message. Notice verse number one. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh eastward, and behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men, among whom I saw Jeazaniah, the son of Azar, and Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. Then said he unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel in this city, which say it is not near, let us build houses. This city is the cauldron, and we be the flesh. I'm going to stop right there. Let's pray. Father, as we bow before you this evening, Lord, we can take the approach of a number of Bible scholars and theologians and preachers of our day and time and say that the Old Testament is irrelevant to uh, today, that we shouldn't go back into the, the Old Testament and pull out truths. But, uh, Lord, I, I'm of the opinion and of the belief that, uh, Lord, the, the Lord Jesus Christ himself uh, pulled Scripture from the Old Testament and authenticated it uh, in the New Testament, in his teachings and his preaching. The Holy Spirit pulled those, those same texts from the Old Testament and brought them into the writings of, uh, uh, of Peter and, and Paul and, uh, and Jude and James. And uh, Lord, as we look at the Word of God, Lord, we, we don't want to discount any portion because it's all important and germane to the truth that we learn. Lord, help us tonight to see a picture and a pattern of what you're trying to show us in the Word of God tonight. Father, use me by the Holy Spirit's power to bring the message that would speak to our heart. 
For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as we look at this and we look at these names, there's a phrase at the, la the very last phrase of, uh, of verse number 1. It says, princes of the people. Now, these there's 25 priests. And you would expect that if you are looking at this and it less, less says there's 25 of these priests, that you would probably consider that they would list the name since they listed two of them. But the other 23 were unimportant in this, in this instance. The phraseology that is there, we, we talked about Jeazaniah and Azur and, and Pelatiah and Benaiah, but it says princes of the priest. You can write this down, you don't have to turn there, but the, these these 25 are referred to in several different ways. Isaiah, in Isaiah 43, 28, calls them the princes of the sanctuary. The princes of the sanctuary. They had the responsibility of the order of, of service. They, uh, they took care of the, of the laying out of the sacrifices, of, of taking care of the uh, daily ministration of, uh, of the temple of God. And so Isaiah refers to them as the uh, the princes of the sanctuary. In Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse number 14, uh, they are called the chiefs of the priests, the chiefs of the priests. However, Ezekiel refers to them as the princes of the people. I got to thinking about that and, and thinking, now why is it that he's, they're referred to as the princes of the people? And then it popped in my head in Revelation chapter 3, and verse number 14. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 14, let me lay a foundation for you. Chapters uh, uh, 2 and 3 are the letters that Jesus wrote to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And he addresses himself to the church of Ephesus, to the church of Sardis, to the church of Philadelphia, to the church of uh, uh, Thyatira, and it's all referred to as the church of. The very last church that is written about is the church of, it's not the church of Laodicea. It's the church of the Laodiceans. You see the difference? This is the church of Ephesus. This is the church of Smyrna. This is the church of Sardis. This is the church of, uh, of Thyatira. This is the church of Philadelphia. This is the church of the Laodiceans. You see, when you put the Ians on there, it says the, it's talking about the people. This is the people's church. And in the last days, Jesus was saying, these are all churches that were active during the time that John the Revelator wrote uh, the, the book of Revelation under the inspiration uh, of the Holy Spirit of God. And he, as he's writing to these seven churches, these seven churches are active churches in that day and time. But they are also historically churches that are prevalent in our churches today. We have the church. We have the revived church. We have the church of brotherly love. We have, you know, the church that, that that's lost its first love. We, I mean, we have we have these different churches, and we see a, a smattering, a picture of each one of these churches and the different churches that we are associated with uh, in, in our day and time. That last church, the last church that will be in existence in, uh, before the coming of our Lord and Savior, before the rapture of the church, will be the church of the Laodicean. It will be the church of the people. And so if you look at it from Ezekiel's standpoint, we will say that they are the princes of the people, it's the people that they're associating themselves with. And so rather than elevating themselves up, they are becoming like the people, and they are becoming part of uh, the, uh, the problem, literally. In our day and time, we, we, we're smart enough to look, and you know, I said the other day, not, it's not be, that, just, that we're Baptists, and all Baptists are going to be in heaven, and nobody else is going to get there. You know, I hate to shock you, but there will be a few Methodists in heaven. 
my grandmother I know will be there. I mean, there'll be a few Presbyterians in heaven. There'll probably be a few Pentecostals in heaven. And a few Church of Christ. A few Catholics. And I, I, I use the terminology few, but, but you understand. People from all denominations will be there. We might be shocked to find that who's not there. Because there's a lot of people that, that, uh, uh, that claim to be Christians that aren't saved. There's a lot of preachers in a pulpit that are preaching every week that aren't saved. And so we, you have to be very careful about what you listen to and how you listen to it. But in this instance, what we're having at the last days, and, and of course Ezekiel's writing not only for the Israelites at that particular time, but prop prophetically into the future. And we'll talk about that as we, as we progress through the chapter. But what we, what we need to understand is that we have a, a group of preachers that are focused solely on people and appeasing the people. Several years ago, a number of years ago, they came out with what is known, we call now the mega churches. And what they did in, in establishing their churches, they went out and they polled the community. What would you like to see in church? What would you like? And, and, of course, they want kids programs for their kids. You know, people don't come to our church because our programs aren't big enough. We have programs, but they're not big enough. They're not massive enough. Okay? The kids lot that come love our programs. But the parents want something more for their kids. They want the lock-ins. They want the gymnasium. They want the, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so it's focused. And so... What they did is they built buildings to for people to come and be in church. The problem was it was a social gospel because they didn't really want to hear anything about hell. They didn't want to hear anything about sin. They didn't want to hear anything about, uh, uh, about judgment. So everything is on a positive plane. Positive. There's one of those churches in downtown Houston that everything's positive. Now, his daddy wasn't that away. His daddy was a good preacher. His daddy preached on hell. He preached a gospel message, and people were being saved. But, and that's the way he started out, but he veered very quickly. And now he claims to have over 40,000 members, one of the largest churches in the world. Honestly and truthfully, if what he's preaching to those people and they're believing that, there's a lot of people in that church that are upset. See, the sad thing is, you've got to have a negative once in a while. If you don't believe me, go out into your car after church, start it up, and take the positive cable off your, off your vehicle. You'll drive all the way home. As long as you don't kill it, It'll stay running. But you go out there and you do the same thing. You, you start your car, you take the negative cable off, and your car will die immediately. You say, why is that? Because you need the negative. Positive, yes. I, I, I'm not saying we, we, we just push the positive away and, and never say anything positive and, and anything encouraging and anything that, uh, that will be a, a blessing and a help to people. I'm not saying that. Because I believe that we need to balance the positive and the negative. Because our cars balance the positive, positive, and negative. Positive and negative are important. And so, how does that fit in with what we're talking about? Well, these guys, what they did was they became the princes of the people, and they began to put forth a message, and the message that they put forth was, hey, we got this. We can do this. In fact, if you look at verse number 2, notice what he says. Then said he unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief, number one. Number two, give wicked counsel in this city and say, it is not near, let us build houses. I want to focus on those three statements this evening 
First of all, they devised mischief among the people. Now, from the looking at on the outside, you say, well, where's the negative? Well, the negative is that everything's positive. There's, there, there, there has to be some negative there. But <laughs> the, the thing is, hey, they're devising mischief among the people. Now, if you look at that word devise, the word devise means to plan, to invent. So what is their purpose? They're devising a plan to reach the people. Not with the gospel, because it's, it's, it's a plan with mischief. The word mischief there in the, in the Hebrew means trouble, wickedness, and idolatry. You say, how does that fit in? If you've read the book of Ezekiel, and you've studied the book of Ezekiel thus far with us, you will find that God's judgment upon the people is because of their idolatry. In the, in the last chapter, 7, 8, 9, uh, or 7 through 10, what we've noticed is, is that they're, they're setting up Baal in the court. They are, they've moved things around. They've put Baal in a, in a prominent place. Uh, they've put the other uh, false gods and false idols out in the opening. They've moved them into the, into the inner sanctuary. Uh, they're, they're placing them in, in strategic locations, and they're saying, these be the gods that brought you out of Egypt. Well, these were not the gods that brought them out of Egypt. There was one God that brought them out of Egypt, and that was God, the creator of heaven and earth. And he was with them day and night without fail. So now then what they're doing is they're saying they're devising a plan of wickedness and idolatry and evil. And they're putting it out to the people. And the people are accepting it hook, line, and sinker. Which is what's happening in our society today. In fact, Bill Hybels, one of the major instigators for the uh, mega churches, uh, came out and said uh, about two or three years ago that this, does, this doesn't work. We're bringing a lot of people in but there's no change. They're not getting saved. They're not giving. They're not because all it is is tickling the ears, making everything sound good. And it's not working. Notice that, they first of all, they devised mischief. Secondly, uh, they gave wicked counsel. They gave bad, wicked counsel. What is counsel? Counsel is saying, uh, it is it is is talking to people and and encouraging them to do the right thing or in some cases the wrong thing, and in this case it is the wrong thing. You know, <laughs> it's amazing to me uh, the number of years that I've been in the ministry. I have people come say, Pastor, can I talk to you? Sure. So we come in the office, we sit down, and they say, you know, I'm I'm having a problem in my marriage. Okay, what's the problem? Well, I already know what the problem is, usually. Before, I even, before they even sit down, I already know what the problem is. Well, my wife just won't do what I, I ask her to do. And she just, you know, she, she just throws up a, a, a fight for every little thing I tell her to do. I have one guy tell me that. I mean, literally. I knew the kid. I knew what his, what his M.O. was. And I said, let me kind of tell you what your, what your day runs. And, and I mean, I laid it out. His eyes got really big like I've been sitting in his living room. And I said, now, you come home and you expect your wife to cater to you and have your meal on the table and have your Dr. Pepper sitting in by your easy chair and your remote there so you can turn turn to your favorite program while she's wrestling with kids trying to get supper done. And you're hollering, when is it going to be ready? And then you get finished eating and you and you get up from the table and you go back to your easy chair and you turn your, your program on that you want to watch and she's trying to clean the kitchen, she's trying to, um, trying to wrestle three kids, get them bathed, get them ready for bed and get them in bed so that 
the two of you can have your time together in the evening time. I said, she's exhausted. I said, when was the last time you came home and said, honey, uh, you just uh, go ahead and I'll go get the, ba- get, get the kids uh, bathed and ready for bed. Or you go ahead and, and do that. I'll clean the table and put the dishes in the dishwasher. Or I'll, <laughs> when was the last time you, oh, no, I don't do that. That's, that's women's work. There's the problem. Or right there. You expect her to perform, but you don't expect to help her perform. You see, now, fortunately, the kid accepted my counsel. It saved his marriage. But there's a lot of people that will listen and just walk right out the door. It goes in one ear and out the other. I'm counseling with somebody right now. They're making a major mistake. And I'm saying... <laughs> I'm sitting across the table from him, and I'm I'm said this is a red flag, this is a red flag, this is a red flag, this is a red flag. Folks, if you see or hear that there's a red flag, stop, turn around, and go the opposite direction. Because if you ignore God's red flags, I will guarantee you, you're headed for trouble. You're headed for danger. That's why the red flags are there. And I said, this is a red flag, this is a red flag. I mean, I, and I had a list of them. Well, but you don't understand, preacher. <laughs> these people, these preachers are giving wicked counsel, and the people are accepting it as truth, as gospel. Do you realize that there are some preachers and some people that, that, that listen to a preacher and accept everything he says without question? I hope you question me. I hope you, you hear me say something. One time I had Moses on the ark. Mrs. J.C. Harrison, most, some of you know her. I mean, she would come to me after church and she'd say, Preacher, she said, Moses was not on the ark. I said, did I say that? Yes, you said that. <laughs> I'm sorry. But you get in, in preaching and you just, you know, and, you, and, you, and you're going and, and you're thinking. I call Peter Paul all the time because Paul is the most prominent in the New Testament. And Paul said, and Paul wrote, and Paul did. And, and then now I'm just studying Peter, and Paul did it. <laughs> you know, said it. God wrote it. Peter wrote, Paul wrote it. And I'm like, wait, no, 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 no. I mean, but there's some people who never question. I made a statement the other day in, in, in a message, and it's something I had to learn in, in Bible college. Uh, and a question came up after I preached on uh, one night. And somebody came out and said, well, preacher, have, have, have you ever heard this and, 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 and questioned me about it? So I had to go back to the study and study. I had to find out the information. That's okay. I don't mind. I don't take it as an affront for somebody to question something I said. It keeps me honest. It keeps me doing the right thing. You know, I don't want to be inundated. Well, preacher, you should have said that. You know, my wife took care of that. You know, you're not my wife. You know, let my wife take care of it. You know, yes, dear. You know. But honestly and truly, they were giving wicked counsel. Number three, notice they said, let us build. Let us build. Now, that sounds good. It sounds wonderful. It sounds great. I mean, who doesn't want to build? Buildings are great. We have a beautiful building that we built out here. And, 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 and there's nothing wrong with that. But the problem was is that God said, this is not going to work. Because of your wickedness, because of your sin, because of your idolatry, I'm going to judge you. Not just Judah, but Israel, the whole lot of y'all, all of you Israelites, from Jacob all the way through to the last uh, of the sons, Joseph, and you're, I'm going to judge all the tribes of Israel because of your idolatry, because of your wickedness, because of your sin, and you're going to go into captivity under uh, what Jeremiah preached in Second Chronicles, uh, chapter 36, I believe it is, and, and all of these things. He said, you're going into captivity. But the princes of the people, Jeazaniah and Pelatiah said, oh, it's time to build, it's time to grow up, it's time to do the, you know, get things going here. That's interesting. 
Because when you look at the names, God hears. I got to get up to my notes here. God hears, God helps, God delivers, God builds. So it sounds good. The message is great. Hey, we need to build. We 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 don't we're not. In fact, they said we. You know, Israel's the cauldron, and, and we're the flesh. We we are the, the the cohesive group that's going to build this city back to where it was. But they weren't willing to turn from their idolatry. They were not willing to turn from their wickedness. They were not willing to turn uh, from uh, from uh, what they were doing from their sin. They just want to keep doing everything and get God's blessings from it. And their names suggest that. Well, God hears, God helps, God delivers, God... Hey, look, look at these four names right here. We're God's men for the project. So what does God have to say about that? Well, let's look at verse number three. Uh, verse number four. Therefore, prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak thus, saith the Lord. Thus have ye said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. Ye have multiplied your slain in this city, and ye have filled the streets thereof with the slain. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, your slain, whom ye have laid in the midst of it, they are the flesh, and this city is the cauldron. But I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. God says, look, you're saying that the city is the cauldron, and we're the flesh. We're the ones that, that fill the pot. We're the ones that are going to do something. God says, no. The city is the cauldron. You're right. But, the flesh are the slain that are being killed because of your wickedness, because of your sin, because of your idolatry. But I will pull you out of that. With God, there's always mercy. God's, God pulled a remnant out. God saved a, a remnant to say, hey, even, even in uh, uh, Elijah's day, after Elijah had that great victory with the prophets of Baal, and then uh, Jezebel sent a message and said, I'm going to kill you just like you killed my prophets. And he turned tail and ran. He's up there in the mountain, and I'm all left alone. There's nobody but me. I'm the only one here. Just won't go ahead and kill me. <laughs> if he wanted to die, Jezebel would have accommodated him. He didn't have to run. And God said, Elijah, lift up your eyes and look to the hills. I have 7,000 prophets that have not bowed the knee. Obadiah was taking care of them, feeding them, take, taking care of them under God's direction. He said, you're not alone in this. You see, God has his remnant. Even in, in, in Romans chapter number 11, uh, or chapter number 10, I believe it is, uh, Paul says, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. And he speaks about a remnant of people that are still there that are going to receive the message of the Word of God and come to know Jesus, the Savior and Lord of their lives. There is still a remnant of, of Israelites that God is going to bring forth uh, in victorious uh, success and salvation and preaching of the truth of the Word of God in these last days. You continue the message and notice what he says. In um, verse number 8, Ye have feared the sword, and I will bring the sword upon you, saith the Lord God. And I will bring you out of the midst thereof, and deliver you into the hands of strangers, and will execute judgment among you. Ye shall fall by the sword. I will judge you in the border of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. This city shall not be your cauldron. Neither shall be the flesh in the midst thereof. But I will judge you in the border of Israel. And again, ye shall know that I am the Lord. For ye have not walked in 
my statutes, neither executed my judgments, but have done after the manners of the heathen that are round about you. God said, no. I'm still going to judge you. Judgment's still coming. By the way, people still didn't hear it. People still didn't want to hear it. People still didn't want to, you know, even in our day and time, they don't want to hear about judgment. They don't want to hear that, that God's going to judge America because of their wickedness and their sin and, 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 and the perversions that we are uh, legalizing and the freedoms that we're taking away, being taken away from those of us who are committed Christians. They don't want to hear about all that judgment. They don't want to be, hear about hell. They don't want to hear about uh, the flames of fire uh, that, where they're going to spend eternity. They don't want that. By the way, they don't want to hear the name of Jesus either because that brings conviction in their hearts. Notice the next verse, 13. And it came to pass when I prophesied that Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, died. Did that just sink in? Did that sink in? Let me read that again. It says, And it came to pass when I prophesied that Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, died. Who is Pelatiah? Who is Benaiah? God delivers, God builds. Die. Isn't it interesting that Jaath and Iah didn't die? God hears, God helps. Because God is always here to hear. He's waiting. In fact, in First Chronicles or Second Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. Verse number fifteen, we never quote says, "Now mine eyes are open and my ears are attent unto the prayer that is made in this place." Hey, if you want revival, if you want a change of heart, if you want a change of direction, if you want to, uh, God to bless you, then this is the formula to do it. My people, what you call them, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will act. Then I will forgive their sin and heal their land. But he's not going to forgive their sin and heal their land until the other four parts are done. You see, in our, in our churches today, we're, we're saying, oh, well, God's obligated to hear us. God's obligated to, to, uh, uh, to deliver us. God's obligated. God's not obligated to anything. God has a formula by which he is going to act. In computer programming, they call it the if-then clause. If this happens, then this is going to happen. When I worked for Foley's, we, we had a computer, TI-40... Something nine eight, I can't remember what the, what it was. Forty four nine eight, and uh, uh, you could program it to talk. Now it didn't have a it didn't have a pro, it had a processor, but it didn't have a, a internal memory. You used a cassette tape. Am I dating myself? And you saved everything to a cassette tape, and you wrote this program. And, and literally, I mean, I, as basic as I was, I had taken pro programming courses. I wrote this program, and I I made it you know uh, do this. And it says, now, if, you, if this happens, then this. If A happens, go to B. If B happens, go to C. It's called the if-then clause. And God has the if-then clause. If you will do these four things, I will do this. Now I'm waiting for you to respond. Where's the response? You see, God doesn't respond until we respond. Until we act upon what his word is. And so they, weren't, they, they were not willing to act. They were not willing to do what God told them to do. And they knew exactly what God wanted them to do. But they weren't willing. Like most people today. And so when we come down to it. The irony is in the name. Pelatiah died. 
saying God is not going to deliver and God is not going to build. He's still going to hear. He's still going to help. But he's not going to deliver and build. And yet, when we follow the next few verses here, notice if you will, verse 14. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, thy brethren, even thy brethren, the men of thy kid, in all the houses of Israel, holy, are they unto whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get you far from the Lord. Unto us is this land given in possession. That's an interesting statement. Get you far from the Lord? It Shouldn't it be get close to the Lord? God gave us this land. God gave us what we have. Let's get closer to him. Let's see what God will do. Let's see if God will bless us. But no, let's, let's get away from the Lord. See, our society says, all, nobody wants to believe in God until you have a natural disaster. In fact, the, 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 our insurance companies call, call it, uh, uh, what is it, uh, uh, an act of God. Hurricanes are an act of God. Earthquakes are an act of God. Why, are, why is it an act of God if you don't believe in a God? Why, why is it an act of God? Well, you know, people, why is all this violence in school? How come God lets all this violence? How does, why does he let all these students die uh, at the hands of other students? Why does God allow that? Well, you don't even believe in God. You've kicked him out of your school. He's not allowed in the school. How do you expect him to protect the children in the school? But we want to blame God. My marriage fails, it's God's fault. It's your own stinking selfishness, the reason your marriage failed. You see, we always want to blame God for everything, and God is not at fault. God has said, if you will do this, I will do this, but you've got to have to do it my way. I'm a God of righteousness. I cannot sin, I will not sin, I will not lower myself to your standards. You have to come up to my standards. One of the major problems in education in the United, in education in the United States is that we've lowered the standards so far to bring those who are so low up so that we can report all these great numbers. But it's nothing but a lie. It's nothing but a lie. Why is it that the Asian schools, China and, and, and Japan, these, their, I mean, their kids are, are brilliant. I'm not saying our kids aren't brilliant, but I'm saying we're, we just keep watering it down. We keep lowering the standard. Our churches are doing the same. We just keep lowering the standards, lowering the standard, lowering the standard, because we want to get more people in. It's not getting more people in unless you're uh, one of these mega churches that it's going to cater to. Come as you are, leave as you came. No change. I've tried to get my neighbor across the street from me. She has four boys. I've tried to get them to come, uh, let, her, let them come to church, to our youth program. They're, they don't go anywhere. Oh, no, we have our church. And one time a year, they go to their church. They have a lock-in. They bring their Xboxes and their whatever other boxes they have, and they sit there all night and play games. No preaching. I mean, I've asked them. Do y'all have a devote? No. Do y'all preach? Did they say anything about the Bible? No. We just play games. Is it any wonder why America's in a mess? Because we want to tickle the ears. Notice the next part. Therefore, verse 16, thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, notice the next three-letter word, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. God's not casting them off completely. There's still a remnant. He said there will be, be a little sanctuary, a little place of worship even in the places where they go. Notice verse 17, Therefore thus saith the Lord, God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries 
where ye have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And they shall come thither, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof, and all the abominable abominations thereof from thence. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things, and their abominations, I will recompense their way upon their own head, saith the Lord God. The next verse we read last week. The glory of God is removed from this point until chapter 43. They're left to themselves. Verse 24, Afterward, the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to them of the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. Then I spake unto them of the captivity all the things that the Lord had showed me. He said, God left. God's glory went up. I went back to Chaldea by the river Kibar. And I sat down. And I told him exactly what God said. You see, the problem with telling people what God said is that some will do it. Most won't. Most will heed the, the warning. Most won't. Years ago, and I'm dating myself again, used to drive down the road and, and you pass a police officer coming you know they were running radar in the opposite direction and so you passed them and then you started flashing your lights down the, down the road to warn them <laughs> anybody do that <laughs> uh, you get caught doing that you get a ticket given a warning and you know some of those guys they will man they'll they'll, they'll slow down quickly some of them just don't take the warning. Just keep going. Next thing you know, you pass by. They're sitting on the side of the road with those little lights passing behind them. And you're going, buddy, <laughs> you should have taken the warning. Church, we ought to take the warning. We ought to take the warning. The last part of that, talking about giving a new new heart and all, oh, is during the millennial reign of Christ. When all the sin will be remitted and all the People will come and worship the one, one true living God. And that day's coming. But we ought to live for God here. We ought to serve Him here. We ought to do what we can here until that time comes. We ought to be faithful to listen to the Word of God and heed its work, counsel and its word so that we can reach more people with the gospel of Christ. May we stand for prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of the Word of God. Lord, it, it seems like that each week as we study through the book of Ezekiel, it just gets more bleak and more bleak and more bleak. But even in the bleakness and in, in, in the, the, the words of, of caution, the words of judgment, God puts a little gem there that says, look, I'm not going to cast you all off. There's going to be a remnant. There's going to be people that are still going to serve you, serve God, and do the right thing and follow the right path. Lord, I pray that we would be those that would follow that direction in our lives and that we would serve you and honor you with our lives. Father, there's someone here tonight that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of the life. I pray, Lord, that they would come and trust him tonight. Lord, there's somebody this evening that needs to come to an old-fashioned altar and do business with you. Lord, I pray that they use this time. In Jesus' name we pray. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, Brother Gary will play the invitation song. God deals with your heart. You come.